Coming up next on Bravo, he's the most prolific and in some ways the most elusive of the surviving Fab Four. In this exclusive profile, Paul McCartney opens up about his creative process and about what life is like as an ex-Beatle on The South Bank Show, next on Bravo. Hello. For the last two years, Paul McCartney has been working on a new feature film, Give My Regards to Broad Street, directed by Peter Webb. A musical fantasy, Broad Street was conceived, written, and initially funded by McCartney, and marks his first major involvement in a film since Help, A Hard Day's Night, and The Magical Mystery Tour. Not surprisingly, the film contains a great deal of music, some original, and numbers drawn from the whole of McCartney's repertoire, covering The Beatles' Years, Wings, and his most recent solo albums. Broad Street also marks McCartney's first chance to score a full feature, and as collaborator, he chose George Martin, the man responsible for producing the first hit he ever wrote. This gave us our line on the project, and over the course of a year, the South Bank show followed the making of Broad Street. John Carlos' film concentrates on the composing, recording, and mixing of the score and the soundtrack, sitting in on the professional relationship between Paul McCartney and the musical director, George Martin. <laughs> Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> let's write the song right here. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or whatever. What's it in air for? What's it, is it? That's oh, there, yeah. 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 So you're using a C7. In, in the key of F. Yeah, that'd, that'd make a lovely song. What was that? That's an, that's an E flat minor. It's a great effect. Yeah, it'd be good. Yeah, let it hang on and shh. Yeah. Road drills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I started it, uh, I'd heard all these terrible stories, you know, and I say David Putnam had said to me, be prepared to give up a year of your life. And I really didn't like the thought of that. I thought, well, no, you know, it'll take some of my time, but I'll be able to do plenty of other things. So I fought that idea, and when Peter and I were going to make it, I said, look, one thing we've really got to try and say we're going to do is, like, enjoy ourselves on this film. Because they all have heart attacks and tear their hair out and all go mad. So, so we've got to really try and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what do you think? I yeah, should, uh, you know, come on strong, strong or, think. or just, strong. just, you know. He needs his motivation, just, Pete. Just, uh, I think it's, um... Do you, know. you want the moody? Do you, do you want, want the moody? Do you want the moody, Pete? Or do you want the... I think it's... He's got to know. He's got to know. Between that and the other. You know. Okay, okay. Somewhere. I've got it clear. That's clear. <laughs> you want to figure out I've got it. I've got it. He's got it now, yeah. So, so yeah take this glass of wine and go and sort it out. 
The point is that we are sitting in the middle of a traffic jam, the proportions of which would astound you. I just wanted to do a film. I wanted to be involved in making a film, one way or another. And I was looking for scripts, looking through scripts, as everyone does. And uh, I didn't really find anything that I wanted to do. So I was in a traffic jam one day, and I decided to have a go at writing something, you know, that might be a, a script for a TV film or a feature film or something. Um, so I started doing that in longhand with pencil, um, just filling sheets of paper. And eventually I had a lot of paper in a plastic bag. So I um, put that in order and then sent it to a couple of people and said, what do you think of this? And they sent it back with another script attached, saying, what do you think of this? Don't like yours much, but this one's great. So uh, I was getting a bit discouraged. Um, what didn't they like about it? Did anybody say what they didn't like about your film version? Um, I think, looking back on it, what, they, what I wouldn't have liked about it was its unprofessionalism. Uh, it's nice to get things like scripts where you've got some idea of what's going on. I'd left a lot to my imagination and to the director's imagination. Um, because I didn't know formally how you write a script, saying cut to, you know, and then all that paragraph and then dialogue and all that, I'd done it more like a kind of school essay or something, you know, just I hadn't bothered about the technical side of it. You're appearing in it, you're starring in it, and you're starring in it as somebody who is based on yourself. Mm. Um, how modest. How did you manage to cope with all that? <laughs> Modesty is overwhelming, isn't it? Modest <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, you won't believe it when I tell you, but the real truth is, and it was only halfway through the filming that I realised what I'd bitten off. Suddenly realised the film hinged on me, and whether I was good in it or not. I hadn't realised that. So it came as a surprise, actually, when I suddenly realised I had all these pressures. Um, but it's nothing new, really. You know, I've felt that pressure before, where you suddenly think, Oop. And there's no turning back. You can't just... You, you do feel like ringing everyone up and saying, listen, let's, let's not make this film. Let's forget. Let's all go to Brighton. You know, but you know you can't. You know you just can't. So you just stuck with it. There were a, two, a couple of weekends, though, when I did suddenly think, oh, God, you know. I'm putting my whole reputation on the line. I'm, you know. <clears throat> and action, gentlemen. Does that sound to you like a man who's planning to rob someone? Hello, I'm Terry. We met a long time ago at the Playhouse. I think so. Yes, oh, yes, yes. How nice. Follow me. What are we doing? Interviewing two songs. Yes, well, we'll do the interview first, if you don't mind. So where's the capos, then? Which is the one that's wide enough? All of these are wide enough. As well as acting and writing, Broad Street provided McCartney with his first opportunity at composing incidental film music. In the past, he has written film themes, most notably The Honorary Consul and Live and Let Die, which was scored and arranged by George Martin. Here they adopted the same technique they've used over the years. McCartney providing the musical outline and composition, with George Martin scoring, shaping, and producing the performance. Play this just with the original guitar, just not the two. Yeah, a bit more original. It's very high up the neck. Can't really get my fingers to bug it. I don't think it matters playing that middle, because I don't think it'll get in the way of the harpsichord anyway. <clears throat> but I'll work something out. Okay. George Martin's association with McCartney began in 1962. In eight years, he produced every record the Beatles made, including 17 number one hits. His production became an integral part of their success. Cuddle up, lads. With the demise of the Beatles in 1970, Martin never expected to work with any of them again. It came as a surprise when, eight years later, after Wings, McCartney approached him to work on his new solo LP, Tug of War, and subsequently, Broad Street.
Well, one of the things that worried me when we started working together, and I said this before we actually started working, do you think it's a good idea? Because, you know, why spoil a beautiful friendship? Um, because he'd been used to working by himself for seven or eight years and wasn't used to having a producer telling him, that's no good, or we sh you should do this again. Or, and I wondered how he would react to it. And he said, oh, we know, we know each other so well, I don't think it'd be a problem. I said, well, there might be, but we'll see. And um, the first thing that happened was, I, he, I said, well, first of all, I, I think we ought to look at your material and see what the songs are like. And he said, well, do you mean I've got to pass an audition? <laughs> so I could see that that was, might have been a problem. Uh, but in fact, it worked out fine. We, we, start, we got into a, a method of working where we weren't rubbing each other up the wrong way too much. There's got to be a certain amount of abrasion. Yeah, that's for me. If you have an idea for a bit of picture, mind just wondering if you really worked that, it. That, that, um... Be good to see it. That's what the idea is. You know, to mm. have a look at it, some pictures, and see what it does now. You know, talking about worried music and yes. stuff. This, do you this kind of do you works. Do want to any of those down? What's the sort of strict function of the producer in the case of working with the client and so used to working on his own? Well, we make up our own rules, don't we? Mm. Uh, in my case, uh, in starting off with Paul, I said, "Well, this song is great," or "This song." is lousy, or this song is, can be good if we modify it. In other words, you need another verse here and you need to go somewhere else which you haven't written yet. You could do something different to it. And I think that's in the wrong key for you. You should put it down a bit. All those kind of things, you know, and uh, it's just a question of shaping. Someone like George, I, I know how he works and he knows how I work. Uh, so you don't have to go explaining uh, to each other what you do. But the main thing is that he just is very good. He's a very good producer. Can I get some of your time later to talk? You can have hours, but you've got to give me a minute. See you later. So is this the right vocal? I think so, yeah. One. We'll check it. Yeah. One, two, one, two, three, four. Ballroom dancing is one of the major production numbers in the film. It was first recorded for the Tug of War LP. choose the songs for the film? When I wrote the script, I just put mu music one to ten. I just sort of said, he goes here, so and then they do music one, uh, music two, music three, music ten. And I left all the songs open uh, till the last possible moment. And then I gave the director a list of songs that I would be happy to sing. Because some of them, you know, you just... They may be nice songs, but you're not in the mood for them. You, you know, you go through periods where a painter likes that painting, uh, and then he goes off it, and, you know, or an album track. You, you love one, and you go off it a bit, and you just... So I gave him ones I was on at that particular time. And uh, he mainly uh, narrowed it down to stuff that uh, we agreed would work with the plot. So that we put it in mainly for plot reasons, most of the songs. Like cats and dogs. Yeah, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's wrong. I mean, everything's live, so that should be... We've got a different take there. It, I think it's um, 694. Yeah. 694. We knew in the story we were going to be at a film studio. And that meant to me that that was the, the greatest excuse to do a production number, which I'd secretly fancied doing anyway. Because those I like those numbers in a big Fred Astaire number or... I mean, what's that one with that huge cake? 42nd Street, is it? Yeah, the right. Endless Busby yeah. Barclay. I mean, I like all that stuff. I've always liked that. Just I like a big show like that, you know. So I wanted to do something like that in, in the uh, film. And Peter, <clears throat> Peter Webb, the director, liked ballroom dancing particularly. He liked that number. And so he said, can we do that, please? You know, he, he put in his requests too. So, um, obviously, you know, if the director's requesting to do it, he's got some feeling for it, too. So it all just came together like that, you know. 9.40, take two, B and C cameras. <laughs> OK, yeah, here we go. Uh, play for Jack, and I'll play back.
rehearsing and filming to pre-recorded playback tracks is the conventional method of production for a musical. But in the case of Broad Street, this was overlaid with a more sophisticated recording technique. One of the main things that Paul said to me when we started was, um, I'd like the music to be exciting because I don't want it to be pre-recorded and mimed to it. I, don't, I think it's pretty dull stuff. So he said, I want everything that we see in, on the film to be live. And I kind of did my skeptical bit and I said, well, do you really mean that? Because that, that's, that's a pretty awesome task because if you're singing a, a pretty important song with a lot of uh, complicated backing, um, to do it live with all the cameras, you know, worrying about your camera angles and everything else and all the sets, you're asking for too many things to be taken into consideration for that shot. He said, I don't think so. So I said, well, in that case, let's cover ourselves. Let's first of all do the tracks in the, in the ordinary way, the way films are normally made. You normally do your music first and then you set it up and film once, it's, once the music's done. Uh, but then also let us record live on top. Um, and we wanted to record in 24-track form. So we actually were playing back 24 tracks into the film studio, recording 24 tracks and locking to camera. And all those, those, those three things together, I don't think have ever been done before. We wanted to avoid the thing where you see a film and the camera goes into a guitarist's fingers and it's a guitarist you really love and you love his style and he's not playing it. He's, play, he's down here playing some bass solo or something, and the guitar's going, dear, dear, screaming away up here. And anyone who can play guitar, and that's a lot of people like me, uh, know that that's happening. Anyone who can play piano knows if you're up there and it's sounding like this, there's something wrong somewhere, you know. Uh, so to get over that, we had to, if you went in on a close-up, we had to re-record live. And that gave the camera people and the technical people a lot of synchronization problems. Your lead time in will be from, but it always wasn't such a pretty sight, okay? So, Chris, we won't bother about it. You'll hear it on playback this time. We'll learn it from that, okay? That's it. Sure. Uh, but this is where we used to go, you know, and uh, say, I only ever dared to ask any a girl to do the last waltz. And that was because you had to do one dance, so you wouldn't feel you'd been to a dance. And uh, it was nearly always a fight. Uh, especially when we were the band, there was always a fight. You know, so it's a mixture of all of those memories. You were saying about the fight always seemed to gravitate towards the always band. Always gravitates towards yeah. the band, and they always try and get on the stage, because it's showbiz, really, a, a ballroom fight. Are you talking about early Beatles days? Or, oh, yeah. 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 Grove in the ballroom, Wallace the Grace, with me little El Pico amp. And some fella grabbed it and he said, one move and you're dead. <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> The re-recording of live music over pre-recorded material worked well with songs of fixed length. But in ballroom dancing, a number with an extended choreographed middle section, problems arose when the action failed to fit the music. Well, up till this morning, uh, this number was running 4 minutes 16 seconds, and that was the track we prepared about two months ago. Uh, but then when they, when they set it up in position, they saw all the hundreds of people involved and all the amount of time it took, they realized they weren't going to get the whole action sequence in in our 4 minutes 16 seconds. So the director came to me and said, we want to extend the track by a minute and a half. Well, it's already re been recorded, so I had to go away and do some experimental editing, which I presented back to him as a kind of demo. And they're going to rehearse with that this afternoon. Have you got the... Yeah. Is this the edit you've done? Yep. Do you know where it goes into the brass bit? From, yeah. From the brass bit comes... Yeah, the vocal comes back in. If instead of having the um, rhythm bit, I think we cut straight into the voice. One, two, See what you think. one, two, you've done three. It, Still 
so wish we'd done that. That's all right for me, though. Timber, the best. I'll bet you get it. Everyone would have it best for everyone to know yeah. about the key chain right. and also to do it right. But then that needs us to put it on the slave, which needs us to like harmonize it all up or something or something. I'm not sure anyway. You know, I was, I was wondering it, about what we'll know today. A little bit. The, uh, what we need today on ethnic maybe. Well, know, what we know on this. the on the rehearsal is is uh, how many of those bars. Whether we need that full length of bars for the fight sequence anyway. If we do, use I mean, you might do your key change within that and come back to the other one. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's that one kind of way of stuff doing. we can do. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. That's right. Yeah, yeah maybe it might be nice to just do something. Like that. Okay, but that's good for length, so All let's right, just check leave. with the... Uh, okay. See if Peter's happy with that. Right. Okay. Lunch! I mean, this section here, you see, obviously is repeated with different faders up. For the, yes, because we had to lengthen it. Exactly. Um, so we have to mix it separately, do we? Yep. Well, you see, we've got, what we do is we go over the whole tape again and we bring up different faders to overlap that particular sequence to make it longer. Because yep. the film is about two minutes longer than the, what we've got on tape. Yeah. And then we can, yeah, overdub on that then, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that should work. I like that effect, actually. Like I think that'll work if we use it, you know, yeah. with a certain de uh, discretion. With no discretion whatsoever. <laughs> the worst possible taste. Right. <laughs> Have you got those words, Trev? A unique feature of Broad Street is the inclusion of three of McCartney's most popular early songs, including For No One and Eleanor Rigby. Until this South Bank show, he's never re-recorded or been seen performing these songs. Okay, something like this then, George. Your day breaks, mm. your mind aches. You find that all the words of kindness linger on when she no longer needs you. She wakes up, she makes up. She takes her time and doesn't feel she has to hurry. She no longer needs you. And in her eyes you see nothing. No sign of love behind the tears Cried for no one A love that should have lasted years mm -hmm. You want her, you need her And yet you don't believe her When she says her love is dead You think she needs you French horn In her eyes you see nothing No sign of love behind the tears Cried for no one Love that should have lasted years You stay home she goes out, she says that long ago she knew someone, but now he's gone, she doesn't need him. Your day breaks, your mind aches, there will be times when all the things you said will fill your head, you won't forget her. And in her eyes you see nothing. Sign of love behind the tears, cried for no one. A love that should have lasted years mm. uh, It's just a nice song to sing, that one. It's, um, 
and I like doing it, and it's a long time since I've rediscovered it, actually. I'm rediscovering some of my old songs, because it now is, there's <laughs> a years since we did it. And um, so to re-sing them uh, isn't painful like it would have been 10 years ago when the Beatles were breaking up, because it was a reminder of all the wonderful days. Well, now there's enough water gone under the bridge for it to be a reminder of the wonderful days again and not of the hell of the breakup. <laughs> I'm remembering songs that we did, uh, the Beatles, John and I, uh, did way back when. Uh, and the interesting thing about them is that you don't hear about them these days. You hear about our well-known tracks. You're always hearing about Strawberry Fields or Sgt. Pepper, something, because those have gone down as some kind of milestone. Um, but these other tracks, they were B-sides, and I just remember how they were written and the thrill I got of writing them and, and why I liked to sing them, because the bass line went down as the tune went up or whatever it is. And those things still hold. They're, they're still nice to sing. So something like For No One. I mean, I was toying around with the idea of songs like I'll Get You. I mean, I don't know if you remember that one. It's, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'll get you in the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. But it's, I love it. I love the period. I love the kind of innocence of those songs and, and the structure. Uh, they're just very simple little songs. And so it's nice going back to the, the simplest period we ever had, or I ever had as a writer. Probably one of the simplest periods I've ever been through. And rediscovering that I quite like them and that they weren't just simple to be dismissed. They were lasting simple. I think that, that's what I like about them. Yesterday All my troubles seem so far away Now it looks as though they're here to stay Oh, I believe In yesterday Suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be Everybody appropriate there's a shadow hanging over me For oh, yesterday came suddenly Why is she... Some of the, the fans, not to say, well, to, to extend the word into its full, uh, give it all its syllables, the fanatics about your early songs will think that there's been a huge... Um, sell out a great affront blasphemy to the early songs by redoing them at all i don't know um i i, I thought of that i didn't think long on it but i did think uh oh you're doing you're redoing beatles songs sacrilege wow hey man heavy um but then i thought no that's not true at all they're my songs i mean you mean i can't pl sing them again ever more uh, you know ever again and I thought that was more unreasonable an approach, that you, you're not allowed to sing those songs. I couldn't find one single reason why not, except good taste or something, and I don't think that's true, really. Mind you, Ringo has got another approach. Ringo's got more of the approach you were suggesting, because uh, I wanted to play... Well, I didn't actually want to do it that bad, but the director wanted me to do Hey Jude, I think it was. And there's some very high notes in that, and I didn't fancy recreating them. I mean, you know, the, 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 that's pretty hard to sing some of those bits. So I wasn't looking forward to it, but I thought, well, I'll do it. You know, he, he wants me to do it, no big deal. But, um, you know, I don't like to make these things that big a deal. Because it isn't, really. It's only a song, isn't it? So I, th I was thought, well, I'll do that. And I asked Ringo if he'd be comfortable about doing it. He said, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. You're kidding. He said, you wouldn't drum on any re and Beatles stuff. Um, I think, and his approach is, I've done it. I've made the record where I'm terrific on Hey Jude, and it worked, you know. So don't ask me to do it again. Um, and I understand that, you know, I think that's, that's all right, that he thinks like that. And I did have a bit of that feeling, but not enough of it.
I would take a video home of the scene we were going to do and I would write a tune the way I'd do it, which would be to sort of sing it, whistle it, put it on a cassette and do something, the basic framework, the skeleton of the whole thing. And then I'd sit down with George and show him the video and say, this is what I think. And I'd say, well, I see cellos doing that bit. And he'd say, well, wait a minute, you've just gone out of the cello range, so we'll, we'll bring it up a little bit and we can have the violas will do that. That technical information I need off George, because I, I, if, if, a, if a top note on a French horn is F, you know, I want to hear him play a G. One of the problems in our film is we don't hear anything about eight kilohertz. So all the hi-fi stuff we put in. So can, you play, can you play this with no eight kilohertz in? Knock out everything. Yeah, sure, it's got sound. Can you just one cup of yeah. As well as coming to grips with the technicalities of film music, McCartney saw Broad Street as an opportunity to experiment with new forms of composition. Yeah. And it's not a film going yeah. through a, a photoelectric cell. And the, they just can't cope with well. higher frequencies. That's impossible. The big direction I'd, I was interested in um, was that round about the time of writing Eleanor Rigby, when I it must have been something like, I don't know, 25 or something. I was looking at the age of 30 and thinking, what am I going to be doing then, as we all were? And in my case, you know, it was a sort of young profession, the, the music thing, pop thing. And I was looking at, um, having just written Eleanor and worked with George on this kind of classical, quasi-classical thing, uh, backup, uh, instead of electric guitars for the first time in my life, I quite liked it. I like the tone, I like the dynamics of uh, classical instruments. They're not all just on one level. There's, there's quite good tonal ranges in them. Uh, so I was interested in that. And I did look at the age of 30 thinking, yeah, that's what I could do. I could become more into the sort of the serious side of music rather than just pop hit, pop hit. Um, but that never really happened. Uh, I just still was intrigued with pop hit and three minute folk song. One, two, three. I look at all the lonely people I look at all the lonely people Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been Lives in a dream, waits at the window Wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door Who is it for all the lonely people? Where do they all come from? All the lonely people Where do they all belong? McCartney's chance to extend his composing skills came here with Eleanor Rigby. Using the same theme, the fantasy was designed to move from the Albert Hall into a Victorian landscape. The rough cut of the final sequence proved to be longer than first envisaged, and in its new length was presented back to McCartney for scoring. To make things even worse, just for something to edit to, they'd put a Brahms violin concerto on for the track. So it was like, oh God, you know, what have they left us with eight minutes here that we didn't know was coming? With a Brahms type mood to it.
So uh, that was the thing, you know, it was like, well, how to get out of that was the one. And so I took that kind of problem home and then thought, uh, well, you know, if I turn the sound down on the video, and I just tried to write my own kind, sort of classical music, sort of film score, tunes, really. I mean, it's still just tunes, uh, the way I see it. You know, it's still... I mean, classical music is just a lot of tunes, or one reoccurring tune, or whatever, but it's still, generally, is still what I do. Um, but it's just a different way of doing it. So I approached it from my uh, same old angle, which is to get a tune I like, to voice it the way I like it, to get the dynamics how I like them, to get it to come and go, to reoccur, and to do all the stuff I like to have happen in, in my music. But the big thing was there were no words to help me out, and to suddenly uh, you couldn't keep bringing back choruses and stuff. It had to fit with the film. And um, I must say I enjoyed that. Uh, harking back to this, what will I be doing when I was 30? Here I was at 40, being forced into what I thought I might have been doing at 30. So it kind of fitted. I thought, well, yeah, it's probably about time I tried to just do something um, different for me. So we've ended up, I'm not sure how long it is, I think it's about nine or ten minutes, where it just is pure music. It just is a classical orchestra. Um, and they rabbit on for about <laughs> nine minutes. But I like the end but effect. saying, you know, even Mick Jagger all been saying, well, 50, you can't, he can't be around like that at 50. I mean, we, <laughs> come on, Mick, you know, own up. You know, we just can't love. Anyway, so you've got to be looking at something that's a little bit quieter, and you've got to be looking, in my case, I've always had this thing of composer, as well as sort of singer and bass player. And um, I've always really liked it. It's always been one of my secret little dreams, you know. In a corny way, I've always liked that role of composer. So to see myself actually sitting down at the piano, I was really just checking for boredom and just checking, do I hate this, you know, or am I actually enjoying this? And I found when I got it right, to my satisfaction, I really enjoyed it. As it, 15 years for somewhere else to go. 50, uh, for somewhere else to go, you found one of the things that the other areas weren't attractive enough. I mean, people about your age writing other sorts of music yeah. obviously weren't persuading you that it was a mm. desirable area to enter into. Mm. That's right, yeah. I've always had my idea, um, I had my sights vaguely set on a musical. Probably because people who often used to say to John and myself, when are you going to write your musical then? You know, Lennon and McCartney sounds like a musical writing team, you know. And they did off, uh, often used to say that to us. But uh, no, it's uh, never been attracted by the, the field, really. Uh, I've often thought, you know, one of these days things will be right. You know, things, conditions will be right and I'll feel like doing it. But I don't really like to do anything unless that, what they call fire in the belly is there, you know, if I actually wake up and think, oh, then I, that, I, I'll do a stuff based on, I'll do something based on that. But if I wake up and think, oh, that's a good idea, well, I'm not sure, you know, and the minute I'm backing off, I, I think uh, it's not that good anyway. I like to have quite a powerful feeling about a thing. So with something like a musical and those kind of fields, and even film music, to tell you the truth, 
I'd never... I'm, I'm often... I'm, I've, there's another side of me, my little conscience, saying, come on, you're just posing. You just want to kind of be, you know, uh, th well thought of. Oh, now he's a classical composer. And it's that kind of Liverpool thing saying, oh, you big poser, you know. So I've got to be really sure in my own mind that I'm not posing and that I actually do like it. You know, I don't want to do something just because it's poncy. I want to do it because I actually want to do it. Is there a sense in which you miss having um, that person to talk to, in this case, John Lennon to talk to? Is there a sense in which, if he'd just been here, you could have moved on together? I doubt very much whether John and I would have ever got back together writing. Um, I think because of his uh, breaking up with the Beatles and his association in other fields with Yoko, for instance, he, I think uh, it would have been very hard to come back together. So I doubt whether we would have. You know, there were a couple of opportunities, and you know, before he died, um, and it didn't look like we were really going to get back together again. But. Uh, I would have liked it. I mean, I liked uh, working with John, and I certainly do miss uh, having someone, not having someone. I miss not having someone like that around. Um, but, you know, what can you do? What can you do? I mean, you know, uh, I like... <coughs> the main thing for me with a collaborator is if I think of something, that person then will say, no, that's rubbish, or that's great, or it's average. And the, the feedback I do miss, and John's feedback in particular, because John was um, a special writer. You know, uh, I think his stuff's got a lot of depth and um, he's very easy to write with. But I say, you know, our, our uh, partnership had uh, broken up with the end of the Beatles. And um, so, I mean, what can you do? You know, it, it just came full circle. We did a lot of stuff together. Um, I certainly wouldn't mind now to be writing with him, but he's not here. A whole other mood, so I like this different mood. Everything that happened from then on was his ideas, and without any support from John or from myself or from George or anyone, he was doing it alone, and that was much tougher than he had done before. He's a much more independent person much more powerful person and um, someone that has to be fought occasionally, not just, uh, you know, it's something one, it's a force that has to be reckoned with. But he's also very much older. He's twice the age he was when he started. And uh, he's four years older than I was when we started the Beatles. You know, and I was an old man then. So uh, he is comparatively an old man. So he has had a great deal of experience. He's learned a tremendous amount. And um, the, the curiosity and the, 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 the seeking of new frontiers hasn't lo left him. That's probably why he's gone into the film. He wants to do things that he hasn't done before. And you think that, in a sense, is why he's come back to you, to spark off or to work with someone again? I think, I think he came to me um, because he felt that he wanted a collaborator of some sort, and he knew me, and he could trust me, I suppose. It, the difficulty with someone like Paul is that um, he has so many so many people who want to work with him that, um, for different reasons, that he couldn't entirely trust them, I guess. It's very difficult when you're success as successful as he is, you know, um, to find someone you can really rely upon. But give my regards to Broad Street, I couldn't for the life of me think I was going to write a song saying that unless it was, I'm off on holiday, love, and I'm missing Leicester Square, so give my, it was all, it didn't work. So anyway, in the end, I decided that that wasn't on and that nothing was coming and I wasn't, I didn't feel good about that. It felt like too intense a problem. <coughs> so I did what I always do, give up. <laughs> when in doubt, give in. So that was good, because I got that off my brain. And then I'd been messing around in the studio with a, a bass thing. And it was just jamming one day when I had nothing to do. I come in here and, you know, just have a bit of fun on, on some of the equipment. And this was a bass I had. And I had an echo device on it. And I'd uh, been playing those notes. Dun, 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 dun. And the echo had been taking care of the rest of it. It was going dun, 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 dun. And it made this tune. Dun, 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 dun. And it was a riff and it just went on and on and on and on for hours. But I asked them to tape it in case because I thought it was like a good little idea for something somewhere 
thought it might be good for a chase scene or something in the, in the film. They asked him to keep it. We ended up using that little piece of echoed bass at the very beginning of the picture when the titles came on. Actually, I did think we... Uh, by the time we recorded this, you know, this riff... But we could alter it for different feels, couldn't we, to have a sort of... So I took the, those notes and wrote the tune called No More Lonely Nights, which then we used as a theme tune. Uh, but it just wasn't the title of the film as well. I'll do the C one. You do those chords. I can wait another day Until I call you You've only got my heart on a string And everything a flutter But another lonely night Might take forever Same me love, cause I know what I feel to be right. No more lonely night, never be another. No more lonely night. You're my guiding light, day or night, I'm always there. If you ever did another film, would you take on the whole shooting match again, financing it, virtually producing it, writing it, starring in it, and so on? I've enjoyed doing it, even though I had all those crazy hats to wear. And even though I woke up halfway through it and in panic and thought, what have I taken on? That in the end, uh, it's turned out so that I quite like it, and I like the experience. And I say the disadvantages were outweighed by the advantages. So I'd think that um, I would take on another one. As to whether, I'd probably try not to write it next time. I'd probably try not to be anywhere near as heavily involved. And, I mean, probably if you ask me, I'd probably rather have a little character role rather than the sort of leading man. I'd probably rather just get made up of some 103-year-old old fella who sits in the corner, hey. Because, you know, that's what I really fancy. But again, that's something I've never done. I don't even know if I could do it, but uh, I like having a go at these things. You know. Right to the end. Yeah. Wait. Very end. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. That may need to be a bit shorter for the record. I don't know. We'll see how about that at that fade. I know you like the end bit, but it's run to. You buy it then. I'll buy it. You buy it. I'll give you five. Will everybody else? Of course. <laughs> <laughs>